You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. Today's Bible, June 12th, 2022, was preached by Pastor Joseph Park. I'll be reading the narration of the autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's message, Acts chapter 15, verse 1 to 21. When Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them much to everyone's joy that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted, The Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's heart. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them. For he cleansed their heart through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the under, undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. In this conversation of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it is written, Afterward, I will return and restore the falling house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues, in every city, on every Sabbath, for many generations.
You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. Today's Bible, June 12, 2022, was preached by Pastor Joseph Park. Our written narration of the autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's message, Acts chapter 15, verse 1 to 21. When Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them much to everyone's joy that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers, who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees, stood up and insisted, The Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's heart. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their heart through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way, by the under, undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversation of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted, as it is written. Afterward, I will return and restore the falling house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we shall write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues, in every city, on every Sabbath, for many generations.
Acts chapter 14 ended with Paul and Barnabas coming back to their home church in Antioch after what turned out to be their first missionary journey. I say what turned out to be because they didn't know that there would be subsequent missionary journeys, but there would be. But they came back after that missionary journey where they planted churches on the island of Cyprus and there in another uh, city named Antioch, named Pisidian Antioch, and in a city called Iconium, and then a city called Lystra and Derby, and all these different places they planted churches uh, with mostly Gentile congregants. Not exclusively. These early churches in the uh, Roman world were almost always a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, but sometimes they would be predominantly Jewish with a few Gentiles thrown in, and other times they would be predominantly Gentile with a few Jews thrown in. But they were all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the end of chapter 14 sounds really sweet. It's just beautiful. It's a nice thing for the camera to fade away. And they sort of lived happily ever after, enjoying the Lord's blessing there at the church in Antioch. But, you know, as in any good story, problems arise, right? So here's our problem. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now there they are in the church at Antioch. And they're just enjoying the Lord's blessing. Paul's there, Barnabas is there. They're like pastors, they're leaders, they're teachers in the church there. It's a vibrant church life. This is one of these first churches that was started predominantly out of, out of a Gentile population. And they're just a missionary church. They're blessed until one day these certain men from Judea come and they get some kind of audience among people in the church. I don't know how exactly. Maybe they stood up. Maybe they were invited to be a guest speaker. Maybe they were just working it among the different uh, smaller churches that left in the homes. I don't know exactly how that was. But these Jewish Christians, and I want to make that very clear, these were Christians who came and taught this. They were from a Jewish background, but they were Christians. And they came and they taught the congregation in Antioch that Gentiles may certainly become Christians, but only after becoming Jews, and only after submitting to all Jewish rituals, including circumcision. Now, it was very difficult for some of these Jewish Christians to, to accept that Gentiles could be brought into the church as equal members without first coming through the law of Moses. I mean, think of what that would have been like. You give your whole life to observing the law of Moses. You're scrupulous in caring for it. And then all of a sudden, people are able, supposedly, to come to full faith, to full righteousness with God without the law of Moses. It doesn't sit right with you. And these men, these certain men from Judea, they were so energetic about their beliefs that they went all the way from Jerusalem, from Judea, all the way to Antioch to show them. Friends, that's a distance of some 300 miles. They walked a long way to deliver this message. They weren't content to keep their beliefs to themselves. It wasn't just like, well, this is our personal opinion. No, they taught the brethren in Antioch, coming all the way to Antioch to preach that message. I think of what it would be like. Here it is, basically, I'm speaking before you. Let's just say you're the congregation in Antioch. And I know it's a bad example. They wouldn't have had a room this big to gather in. There were probably this many Christians and more in the city of Antioch, but they wouldn't have had one large place to gather. But let's just pretend, okay? You're the church at Antioch. I stand up and say, listen, you people who thought you were right with God, you people who thought you were saved, I know you mean well, but you're not really right with God. You won't be right with God until you get circumcised and bring yourself under the law of Moses. Then you can be right with God. Oh, God really loves you and he really wants you to be right with him. It's just you've been going about it the wrong way. Your faith in Jesus alone isn't enough. You have to add to it respect and obedience to the Mosaic law. And obviously, they would have thought that Paul and Barnabas had done wrong in the way that they started churches on Cyprus, started churches at Pisidian Antioch, started churches at Iconium and Lystra and Derbe, because those churches were all started on the idea, look, just put your faith in Jesus Christ. This wasn't the message that Paul and Barnabas were teaching. And so these certain men from Judea were criticizing Paul and Barnabas as well. They said, guys, you're doing it all wrong. And notice, if you will, look at it, how central the issue was. Verse 1 says that they said, unless you're circumcised according to the law or the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Friends, can I just point out 
that this was not a side issue. This wasn't just something sort of off on the periphery of the Christian life. It had to do with salvation itself, with how somebody is made right with God. This wasn't the kind of issue where they could just sort of agree to disagree, where, where some believers might say, well, you can be under the law, and other believers might say otherwise. No, it went to the heart of Christianity, and it had to be resolved. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at this, I say that Satan had an unbelievable strategy right here in the book of Acts. This is one of these danger points for the early church. Danger points in two ways. First of all, Satan would have loved to establish a righteousness by works idea there in the church. Satan would have loved to do this, to have to go to all those Gentiles and say, well, I know you mean well at everything, but look, go to our outpatient surgical center and then you can really be right with God. That would have been one aspect of it, but I'll tell you, here's the other aspect. Satan also would have loved it if the truth came out on top, if he could uh, further a bloody doctrinal theological war along the way, right? If the Christians could get their knives out at each other and be filled with bitterness and hatred towards one another. Because even if you're going to come to the truth, man, if you could get some good hatred flowing among believers along the way, Satan's happy about that, isn't he? And so you could see what a danger point this was for the Christians at this early point. Now, what did Paul and Barnabas do? How, what was their response? Look at it there. Verse 2, it says, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. I love what it says in verse 2. Did you notice it? And when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. Now, let me ask you a question. If it's not a small dissension and dispute, what is it? It's a big dissension and dispute. Paul and Barnabas, when they heard these guys teaching this, their attitude wasn't, well, that's just a very interesting theological idea, and I'm sure that's your truth for you, brother, and you know, I'm sure we can all agree to disagree. Paul and Barnabas were like, you got to be kidding me. You guys are crazy. This isn't what we taught in all the churches that we founded out on our first missionary journey. It's not what God says. It's not what the Bible says. And they had a big dispute. I love it that Paul and Barnabas, at least in some kind of loving way, got in the face of these guys and said, no, prove it. Lay your theological cards out on the table. Show us where this is backed up biblically. There was a big dissension and dispute with them. These men, Paul and Barnabas, who saw God work so mightily among the Gentiles, were not going to just accept it when these other people came and tried to invalidate all that work. You could just see Paul and Barnabas say, well, what about all the Gentiles who are loving God and filled with His Spirit now? What are you going to say about them? Well, I don't know. They've got to come under the law of Moses. So what did they do? Verse 2, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem. When persuasion didn't end the issue, then Paul and Barnabas said, well, we're going to get this matter settled by the apostles and the elders who are there in Jerusalem. They were not going to just agree to disagree because at core, what was issue is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Now, friends, listen, there are many doctrinal areas in the Christian life, many aspects of truth, well, I think we can agree to disagree, right? There are certain aspects of our understanding about what God is going to do in the end times. There are certain aspects of church organization or governance. There are certain aspects of uh, how the Holy Spirit works and exactly how we describe His work among the believers. And in certain things like that, there are Christians who can love the Lord and have different opinions. You can think one way, another person can think another way. There's some biblical evidence for both, on and on. There are certain areas in the Christian life that are like that. There are other areas that are not like that. There are other areas where you draw the line. And you say, how is a man or a woman made right with God? What is their standing with God? 
Is it because of what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross alone? Or is it because of what Jesus Christ did plus what you can do? Does Jesus save you? Or do you save yourself with Jesus' help? That's the whole idea. And this was of such a critical nature that Paul and Barnabas could not let it go. That They said, we're going to get this settled down in Jerusalem. We're going to appeal to the apostles and elders. And I like what it says right there in verse 3, that it says that they caused great joy in all the brethren as they traveled north, or excuse me, southward from Antioch all the way down to Jerusalem. Sort of like, you know, rock stars on a tour. They would go to the different churches, Paul and Barnabas, and they'd share what God had been doing among the Gentiles, and everybody loved it. They were just rejoicing because God was doing a great work. Now, they finally get to Jerusalem, verse 5. Here's sort of the argument from the opposition party. Okay, look at it carefully. This is sort of their thesis statement, their complaint against Paul and Barnabas and the work they were doing. Verse 5, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now please understand, look at what it says in the very beginning of verse 5. These people who were making the objection were Christians, but they were Christians who had been saved from a Pharisee background. In other words, the Pharisees were very well known for their high regard of the Mosaic law and their desire to obey God's law in the smallest details. They had a zeal for the law. It shouldn't surprise us that the people bringing this complaint were people who had been Pharisees before they came to Jesus. And friends, if the Pharisees believed anything, they believed that someone could be made right before God by keeping the law. And for a Pharisee to really become a Christian, they would have to take more than just an acknowledgement that Jesus is the Messiah. Oh no, they would also have to say, I put no trust in my own ability to save myself. I'm not trusting myself any longer. I'm going to turn my mentality away from saving myself through my own good deeds. I'm going to turn my mentality towards the living God. You know, we saw it the last time we were in the book of Acts. That when Paul and Barnabas were in a Gentile city called Lystra, that the people got all excited about Paul and Barnabas and wanted to sacrifice to them as if they were Roman gods, right? Hermes and Zeus. Do you remember that? Well, what did Paul say to them? He said, stop. You have to turn from this foolishness and turn to the living God. That you're in the wrong direction. You've got to turn around your thinking. Now, what's very interesting is I think that these Pharisees who wanted to be Christians had to do the same thing. They did not have to turn from pagan idolatry the way that those same people in Lystra did, but they had to turn from their own religious efforts to save themselves the same way, uh, it, turning away from themselves and turning unto Jesus Christ. And... and I'll just say it, that there may be some of you right here this morning. Oh man, you're good people, you really are. And you have a love for God, I don't question that. But you, you think that you save yourself and Jesus helps you to do it. That's kind of Jesus' role. You, you may even think you save yourself by church attendance. Now listen, I'm all for church attendance. By the way, I think Jesus is too. But you don't save yourself by it. You don't save yourself by your good works and Jesus helping you to do those good works. Now, Paul came to this understanding himself because do you remember that Paul himself was a former Pharisee? He became a Christian and he came to know that Jesus didn't help him to do what a Pharisee does even better, but he knew that Jesus was his only salvation. That Jesus wasn't what, what's just isn't the way to salvation, but that Jesus was salvation himself. I love how he spoke about it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. He wrote this, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now do you see how hollow it ring then in verse 5 when these certain men from Judea were saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. 
You see, they were really prescribing being right with God in two steps. First, you have to bring yourself under the Mosaic law to begin with. That was circumcision. Secondly, you had to agree to keep the law of Moses the rest of your days. You got to do both of those things, both as a one-time act and then as a continuing act, if you are going to be right with God. If I could phrase it in another way, basically what they were teaching was something like this. Gentiles are free to come to Jesus, and we want Gentiles to come to Jesus, but they have to come through the law of Moses in order to come to Jesus. Now, Paul and Barnabas, among others, they have allowed Gentiles to come to Jesus without going through the law of Moses, and they thought that that was wrong. So they're going to work it out here, starting now at verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that though the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Can you picture that scene? There they are gathered together in Jerusalem, right? All the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. Now we know who the apostles were, right? The elders, we really don't know. But this was a church council. These were the leading men of the church, not just in Jerusalem and Judea, but in other places beyond. And what an amazing council that would have been to be at, right? And you know, I sort of have a mind and an uh, uh, appreciation of church history. There have been many famous councils throughout church history. Like in the early 4th century, there was the great church council of Nicaea. Wow, what an amazing council that would have been to be at. Later on, there were other great councils that, that the church had, and some of them were good, and some of them were bad. None of them were perfect, but here they gather together with this amazing council of men who are going to discuss and pray about and debate and come to an understanding of this issue. It was far too great to just let everybody figure it out for themselves. And that question raised by the Jerusalem council was immense. Are we made right with God by faith alone or by a combination of faith and good works? How does it work? Well, notice verse 7. Did you like that one? And when there had been much dispute. What does that mean? Much dispute. Man, they argued it out. There were two sides going back very strong. They really hashed it out. They argued back and forth for how long? And I wish somebody would have the minutes of this meeting because it would have been amazing to see, right? Everybody putting forth their best case. Well, then Peter, as one of the leading apostles, he rose up to make his opinion known. And what did he say in verse 7? He said, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, and then he continued on, Peter began with a history lesson, recounting the work that God had already done. And then he made the point that God had fully received the Gentiles apart from their coming under the law of Moses. I, I like what he says in verses 8 and 9. He says, God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And Peter's point is really plain. If God has acknowledged these Gentile believers, shouldn't we also? That makes a lot of sense to me. Matter of fact, he says something like this too in verse 9. He says that God was purifying their hearts by faith. Peter showed them how the heart is purified, not by good works, but by faith. Not by keeping the law, but by faith. And if they were purified by faith, there was no need to be purified by submitting to the ceremonies of the law of Moses. Friends, Christians aren't only saved by faith, they're purified by faith. And so then Peter asked the question in verse 10, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now here Peter's very wisely answering another objection. Somebody might say, okay, Peter, What's the harm? We, the Jewish people, we've done pretty good through the generations, keeping the law of Moses and having our men circumcised. We've done okay. What's the harm in asking this to the disciples? 
or excuse me, of the Gentiles. It's not any more than they've asked of ourselves over these many generations. What's the harm in doing it? Peter says, I'll tell you what the harm is. We haven't been able to keep the law of Moses, right? We have failed God before it. Why are we going to dump that same failure upon the Gentiles that we have lived under the shadow of for so long? And all of that is demonstrated in a survey of Israel's history. You know, you could say that Israel was sort of born as a nation, or at least one of the important early marking points was when they received the law at Mount Sinai. Wasn't that glorious? There they are in Mount Sinai, Cecil B. DeMille in all of his glory right there. Moses receiving the tablets, thunder, lightning, miracles, uh, a voice from heaven pronouncing the Ten Commandments. Amazing. Moses gets the Ten Commandments, and you know what? Before he makes it down the mountain, what are the children of Israel doing? Dancing around a golden calf saying, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. From the very beginning of their receiving the law, they broke it. Then you know what? The very last scene we have in the history of the Old Testament is in the book of Nehemiah. And what is it of? Nehemiah is dealing with these exiles who came back from Babylon. And he's so angry with them because they weren't keeping the Sabbath and they were marrying pagan women. He was so angry with them that he starts hitting them and pulling out their hair. Why? Because they weren't keeping the law of Moses. From the beginning of the history to the end of the history of the Old Testament, they couldn't keep the law of Moses. Oh, now it was very easy to do what these Pharisees or these former Pharisees did. You, you, you look through these ancient things with the eyes of nostalgia. You say, isn't it wonderful how great the law is? Isn't it how beautiful and what a positive influence and all that? And it was good in many ways, but not in every way. And it certainly was not good as a way to make one right before God. Peter lays it all on the line. Verse 11, look at it with me. He says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. That's beautiful. Peter says, listen, it's not by keeping the law, but it's through grace that we're saved, both Jew and Gentile, and not by obedience to the law. You see, if we are made right with God by grace, then we're not saved by grace and law keeping. We're saved by the free gift of God. Now, if you look carefully at verse 11, Peter says something there that's really pretty mind-blowing. Peter would have normally said it like this. He would have normally said, we believe that they can be saved just like us. But is that what he said? No, what he actually said is, we believe that we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And that's glorious. Peter's saying, listen, those Gentiles, they got it. And we're going to be saved in the same way as they are. I, I think that those Pharisees who were objecting, they, they just had a, they almost fainted. They were like, Peter, how can you say it? They need our salvation. And Peter said, no, no, we need their kind of salvation. Coming to God without the works of the law, but rather by a relationship of love and trust in the Savior whom he has sent. Now, I find verse 12 to be absolutely stunning. Look at it there. Have you pictured the scene so far? Arguing back and forth, much dispute. They've been arguing. Now, I don't want to sound ethnic, but, you know, Middle Eastern peoples, they know how to argue, right? They know how to mix it up in a fight. Arguing back and forth. Peter gets up and makes his statement. And look at what it says right there in verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent. Now, that's at least worthy of note that Luke has to write it in, right? All the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declare how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. You see, this shows that even though there had been a lot of dispute, these men were all of an honorable heart. They were willing to listen and they were willing to be persuaded if they were wrong. And here they are listening. It's starting to dawn on them. These certain men from Judea, these men from a Pharisaical background, they're starting to get it. And then Paul and Barnabas come along and say, let us tell you about how God is moving among the Gentiles. He did this in Antioch. He did this in Iconium. He did this in Lystra. He did this in Derbe. And then finally, verse 13, and after they had all become silent. Now how about that, right? There had been a lot of dispute in the room, a lot of yelling back and forth, a lot of, no, you're wrong, no, you're out of order, no this, no that. 
Suddenly they're just stunned into silence. When they had become silent, verse 13, James answered and said, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God had at the first visited the Gentiles to take out from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from the things polluted from, by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Well, again, we note verse 13, the remarkable silence. Again, this shows the honorable hearts of those who would oppose Paul and Barnabas. They didn't endlessly argue the issue, and they were willing to at least think that they might have been wrong. Then James stands up, verse 13, and he said, Men and brethren, listen to me. Now this was the Apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus, the same one who wrote the book of James. And this is the James who gave, had seemed to have great authority in the Jerusalem church. You could almost say that he was the senior pastor of the Jerusalem church. And he made it very clear, verse 14, that God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people. He's saying to his Jewish brothers, guys, God has a people among the Gentiles, not only among us Jews, but he has a people among the Gentiles and the gospel is reaching them and they are coming to Christ. And then he really throws down the trump card in verse 15. Did you notice that? With this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. You see, so far there's been one thing lacking in the whole debate. What do the scriptures say? James brought out, quoting from Amos the prophet, that God was going to bring salvation to the Gentiles. Not to Gentiles who became Jews, but to Gentiles themselves. And now he sees it, he makes it plain, and everybody grabs onto it. In verse 19, he says, therefore I judge. By the way, that's a statement that makes a lot of authority on the part of James. It's as if he had heard all the evidence, and James, as sort of an authoritative man there, he says, okay, we've heard from uh, our friends of a pharisaical background, we've heard from Paul, we've heard from Barnabas, we've heard from Peter, now it's time to make the decision. I see how everybody's going here, therefore I judge, and he made the judgment, verse 19, that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. James essentially said this, let them alone. They are turning to God and we shouldn't trouble them. And at the bottom line, James declared that Peter and Barnabas and Paul were correct and that those of the sect of the Pharisees who believed were wrong. And then in verse 20, he says, but we're going to write to them to abstain from things polluted from idols, from sexual immorality and from things strangled and from blood. Now, this is a very interesting request that was going to be published in a letter sent out from the council. And what about these things? What about these things that they were to stay away from things polluted by idols and sexual immorality and things strangled and, and from blood? What about those? I don't have time to talk about it this morning. We're going to talk about it next week. <laughs> next week, we're going to talk about this letter that they sent out and all what it resolved and all that. I think it's very, very important. But time just escapes and we've got another Sunday next Sunday, right? We'll talk about it then. But the bottom line is James stood up before them and said, these people are turning to Jesus. We're not going to get in the way. Now, how does this apply to us? Well, you know, in some places of the world, it applies more straightforwardly, more practically than you could ever think. I don't know, maybe you've heard me share this story before. If not, it's such a vivid story. I don't have a hard time sharing it again. Uh, some years ago, I was in Israel there for a conference, and I was visiting the wonderful work of the Calvary Chapel in Tel Aviv. What a wonderful guy. Stephen Apple and his wife, Pat, they're doing an amazing work there in Tel Aviv. I love those guys. Well, I was talking to Stephen about the work going on, and he pointed out to me a man who seemed to be Ethiopian. 
Now, there's a fair population of Ethiopians there who have immigrated to Israel, and he was a security guard for the building that they were at, and he was a Christian, a security guard there, just sort of helping the different Christian groups that would meet at the building. And he told me a story about this Ethiopian security guard. He said that just a few weeks ago, he was there doing his job, but the man was in obvious discomfort. Just, you know, he was hurting. You could just see it on his face. This man was in pain. And so he asked him, well, what's going on? And he said, well, the other day, I got circumcised. And Stephen thought that might have been some medical issue. You know, sometimes that would be necessary medically. And Stephen asked, oh, good heavens, what was wrong? Why did you get circumcised? And this is what he said. He said, the pastor of the Messianic congregation I go told me that I should get circumcised to be right with God. I couldn't believe it. Stephen couldn't believe it either. Ladies and gentlemen, there are still people who in a very obvious way say that it's necessary for you or I or somebody else to come under the law of Moses in order to be saved. Not saying, listen, now that you are right with God, go out and live in obedience to him. No, that's not the issue at all. The issue is to do it as a requirement in order to be saved. Friends, I can't think of anything that would be more startling as an example of saying people are turning to Jesus and we don't want to get in their way. And listen, when people are turning to Jesus, they only have to turn to him. They only have to put their faith in him. They don't have to add to it the law of Moses. And I just wonder about it. Are you really aware of that when you talk to people about Jesus? Are you really lifting up Jesus in front of them? Or are you somehow making it seem that it's Jesus plus certain ceremonies, Jesus plus a certain politics, Jesus plus a certain, you know, community mindset, Jesus plus this, plus that. Friends, it's Jesus plus nothing. Jesus alone is our salvation. And so they worked through this and they came to the right decision. Now, I'm just thinking in myself right now. You may be here today. And your trust is not in Jesus alone. Your trust is in Jesus plus the good do deeds that you do. Your trust is in Jesus plus your church attendance. Your, your trust is in Jesus plus uh, your financial contributions. Your trust is in Jesus plus this, plus that. I, I just call on you this morning. I want you to repent of that. And say, no, Lord, I'm going to put my trust in Jesus alone then I will do all those good things out of having been made right with you. Now they came to a great decision with this and they showed great grace in this. See, because what really blows my mind in this whole account, did you see what these men who caused all the trouble were called? Did you notice that in verse 1? Look back at verse 1. These men who caused all the trouble back uh, coming to Antioch, who, what were their names? They're called certain men from Judea. Now, ladies and gentlemen, did they not have names? Didn't Paul and Barnabas and Peter and James, didn't everybody know who these guys were? Of course they did. These were real men with real names. And you know what? They never included their names in the biblical record. Why? Because they changed their hearts. I think that's one of the greatest miracles here. That these men who had this great dissension, this great dispute, oh, Paul and Barnabas, you're wrong. They were able to listen to the truth of God and see the work of God. And you know what? Miracle of miracles. They submitted to the work of God. In my mind, that's one of the most amazing things at all. Not just that a sinner gets saved, but when a stubborn believer has their heart changed by the grace of God. Real graciousness is shown in the way that they never named those certain men from Judea. They had names. Everybody knew who they were. But yet they did not name them so that they wouldn't be in God's eternal word. And that's my final word here. Listen, um, you may be all pro-grace and you're really rooting me on. Yes, we're saved by grace alone. Yes, we're made right by what Jesus did alone. You, you all believe the right doctrines about grace. Let me ask you, are you a gracious person? It's not enough for you to have the right ideas about the grace of God running around in your head. I hope you do. But has it made you any more gracious as a person? 
Or would you be the first one to write out those guys' names in big block letters? Would you be the first one to expose them? And even though their hearts were changed, you wanted everybody to know just who it was that caused all the trouble. Friends, it's not enough just for us to have the grace of God theologically correct. We need to have his graciousness flowing in and through our lives. So I guess I put out a call to everybody here this morning. Grace covers. Grace cares. Grace puts people, especially teachable people, into a very generous place before God. Do do you have the grace of God in right perspective? And then does his graciousness run through your life? It's here for you right now for you to receive by faith. Not just his grace, but his graciousness. Let's pray together. Father, I pray, Lord, um, knowing that there may be some people here this morning, Lord, they realize a light has turned on in their eyes, in their minds, that they have been trusting in Jesus plus something else. Lord, I pray that you wake those people up, And bring them to a place where they trust in you and in you alone. Help them with that, God. Bring us, Lord, to a simple trust in Jesus and not an effort to justify ourselves. Lord, I, I pray also for people in all their zeal, Lord, to be right. In all their zeal to to do what's right. Somehow they've left graciousness behind. Lord, make us a gracious people before you. Stir us up to love and good works. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. The spirit of grace. Not only that we'd have the right ideas, but Lord, that we'd love other people full of the graciousness that you gave us. Do it, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.